last time uh, we finished two noble truths the noble truth of Dukkha and the noble truth of the origin of Dukkha <coughs> now we come to the third noble truth which is the noble truth of the cessation of Dukkha <coughs> Like a physician who diagnoses a patient and then finds a disease and then also knows what causes that disease. So Buddha also diagnoses the living world and then he came up with the diagnosis that the living world or beings <coughs> have this disease of dukkha and this dukkha is caused by craving. Now when the cause of disease is known, the patient will want to know whether that disease can be cured. And fortunately here the disease can be cured and so in order to um, give consolation to beings uh, who are wearied with dukkha and the, 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 the origin of dukkha Buddha said there is cessation of dukkha there is a cure of this disease of dukkha and this cessation of dukkha or absence of dukkha, absence of suffering is what is known as Nibbana. So Nibbana is said to be the third noble truth or the noble truth of the cessation of dukkha. When the Buddha explained this third noble truth, he said it is a complete fading away and cessation of this very craving. Now, it, it's strange here. Buddha was explaining the cessation of suffering. But Buddha said cessation of suffering is complete, that means without remainder, complete fading away and cessation of this very craving that means this craving I have just pointed out to you as the cause of or the origin of Dukkha so here Buddha equates cessation of Dukkha with cessation of craving that is because so long as craving is not, not destroyed, there can be no cessation of suffering. <clears throat> so when the cause is eradicated, then the effect will also be eradicated. And that is why Buddha said the third noble truth, the cessation of dukkha, is actually the cessation of craving. So once craving is destroyed, there, there uh, will be no more uh, rebirth for that person. Because craving is the one that, um, that causes uh, beings to be born, to be reborn again and again. And if you remember the description of the origin of Dukkha, uh, Buddha said, uh, it is craving which gives rise to fresh rebirth. So, so long as there is craving, there is attachment, there will always be rebirth. And when there is rebirth, there is old age, there is disease, there is death, and there is uh, to be associated with what one does not like, and to be separated from what one 
light <coughs> and also not to get uh, what, what one desires and so on. And so, so long as there is this craving, this craving creates uh, ever fresh rebirth. Once craving is destroyed, it is like uh, when, the, when the oil in the lamp is exhausted, there is no more flame. So, <coughs> Buddha described cessation of dukkha as the cessation of craving. And here Buddha said, complete fading away and cessation. Now, craving can be uh, abandoned momentarily or temporarily. But momentary and temporary abandonment uh, cannot give us um, complete, uh, complete freedom from rebirth or complete freedom from dukkha. But here Buddha said, complete or uh, remainder less fading away. So when a person attains uh, enlightenment, especially the fourth stage of enlightenment, he or she eradicates um, craving altogether. And once eradicated, that craving will never arise in his mind. So he will never experience craving or attachment or whatever uh, any longer in, in, in his life. So when the craving, which is the origin of dukkha, is destroyed, then dukkha itself is said to be destroyed. And this uh, the cessation of craving or cessation of dukkha is uh, what we all understand as Nibbana. <coughs> and Buddha continues that it is the forsaking and abandonment of that craving and liberation and detachment from it. So when uh, a person is said to have eradicated craving, he is said to be free from craving, he is said to be liberated from craving. Actually, not only liberated from craving, but liberated from uh, the, the results of craving, say, which is uh, rebirth in this samsara. So this is the third noble truth, the noble truth of the cessation of dukkha. And in one discourse, Buddha said, all the four noble truths can be found in this in this fathom long uh, fathom long body. So that means the cessation of dukkha or cessation of mm, Craving can be seen in one's own self because craving is our, our, ours, our property. And when uh, it is said that craving is destroyed or craving is removed, that means we remove the, the craving which is in us. And so Buddha said, uh, he proclaimed uh, so also and noble truths to be found in this in this body. <coughs> but actually, according to Abhidhamma, Nibbana is an external state. But that external state, people uh, who gain enlightenment take as object, or they realize Nibbana. So, realization of Nibbana is uh, within beings, but the nirvana itself is actually outside, and nirvana is just the uh, cessation of <coughs> suffering, cessation of all conditioned phenomena. <coughs> when there is no more uh, arising of conditioned phenomena, when there is no more 
rebirth, uh, one is said to have uh, achieved or realized uh, nibbana. <coughs> And there are many people who think that Nibbana is, a, is something like a realm or a place or an existence that one will reach after death or something like that. But Nibbana is described as just a uh, cessation of suffering. So the cessation of suffering or extinction of suffering, extinction of mental defilement, extinction of uh, five aggregates of clinging is called uh, Nibbana. And as you may have heard, there are two kinds of Nibbana. Nibbana which is experienced uh, while one is living and then another Nibbana which becomes evident after the death or at the death of a Buddha or, a, or an Arahant. So the first kind of nibbana is actually the cessation of craving. So when a person reaches the fourth uh, stage of enlightenment <coughs> and he realizes nibbana, he eradicates the, the mental, um, mental defilements, including craving. So that removal of or the abandonment of mental defilement or the, the cessation of this mental defilement is called uh, that is a nibbana in this life. <coughs> this can be realized uh, in this life, this can be rea realized uh, by those who attain enlightenment. And the other kind of nibbana is, is called nibbana maybe Nibbana at the death of an Arahant. And that means an Arahant who has eradicated all mental defilements still have this body, uh, mind and body. Because this mind and body are the result of his karma in the past. And so the, 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 these results still remain with him. But when he dies, a, 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 a Buddha or a and Arahan dies, these uh, resultant um, aggregates disappear. Uh, you, you may remember described in Ratanasoda as just as the flame goes out, these um, uh, Arahans disappear. So at the moment of death, uh, five aggregates as uh, five aggregates that uh, that are called remaining because uh, they, are the, they are the remaining from the mental defilements also disappear and so that is called the uh, nirvana at the death of the Buddhas and Arahants. So there are two kinds of nirvana. <coughs> I'm more interested in the first kind of nirvana. I don't, I'm not interested in what will happen after the death of an Arahant or a Buddha. But uh, we can realize Nibbana in this life if we try, if we, if we have uh, real enough uh, perfections or paramis, and if we uh, make mm. effort say, to, to reach that stage. <coughs> and it is, I think, more more what can I say, more attractive than the other Nibbana. The other Nibbana we don't know. But this Nibbana is freedom from mental defilement. You, 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 you consider that state. If you are really free from mental defilement, you have no mental defilement, you are not attached to anything, you are not provo uh, you, you do not get angry, although there is uh, provocation, and you are not moved by ups and downs of life, you are enjoying Nibbana. So that, that is a state uh, we all uh, should try to, try to reach, if possible, in this very life. And if not, it may take uh, two or three more, uh, more lives. But this, this is more attractive than uh, what, what will happen after the death of an Arahant. <coughs> 
So towards this goal, um, the the extinction of mental defilements, uh, we should direct our effort. So this is the third noble truth. And then the fourth noble truth is, as you know, the practice that leads to the cessation of dukkha or that goes to the cessation of dukkha. Now when the, the patient knows that his uh, disease is curable, the next question he, want, he wants to ask is, what medicine shall I take? And then the phys- a physician may um, con- concoct some medicine for him. If, if you are a, a, a native physician, uh, you, may, you may collect uh, roots and other herbs and then uh, prepare medicine for him. So in the same way, Buddha prepared the medicine for, for the um, cure of the disease of Dukkha. And there are eight ingredients in the medicine Buddha gave to the world. And you know these eight ingredients. <coughs> so uh, the fourth noble truth is the way or the practice that leads to cessation of dukkha. The Pali, I think I, I, I explained this uh, in my last talk. Uh, the Pali word says, uh, that goes to, uh, not that leads to, that goes to the cessation of dukkha. And that goes to means that takes cessation of dukkha as object. When our mind takes some object, we say my, our mind goes to that object. So the, the, the meaning explained in the commentaries is that it is a practice, it is a way that goes to the cessation of dukkha, that goes to nibbana. So this is the medicine uh, Buddha gave us for the cure of the disease of dukkha. Since it is like a medicine, we must make use of it. Now, the the doctor will give you medicine, but if you do not take the medicine, then your disease will not be cured. So in the same way here, Buddha gave us this medicine, and if we do not take it, if we do not practice uh, his his uh, way, then we will not get the benefit of getting rid of mental defilements. <coughs> so among four noble truths, the fourth one is the most important for us. We may not know about dukkha, or we may not know uh, what causes dukkha, we may not know the cessation of dukkha, but if we know the the fourth noble truth, the right understanding and so on, and practice it, then we will come to see the first noble truth, we will be able to uh, abandon the second noble truth, and we'll be able to realize the third noble truth. So for us, the fourth noble truth is the, the most important. <coughs> it is like a medicine, and so uh, we have to take it, we have to practice it to get the uh, uh, good results of this medicine. <coughs> and this, this path, or this practice, consists of eight members or eight factors, eight ingredients. And this uh, practice is called the middle way. So Buddha had two, two names for this uh, uh, practice. The one is Majjima Patibara, the middle way. And the other is Ariyo Atangiko Mago the Noble Eightfold Path, Noble Path which has eight members or eight limbs or eight factors. <coughs> now we'll, we'll study these eight one by one. Now if you do not remember, don't worry, later you, you, you'll get in this sheet. <coughs> 
Now what are the eight factors? Right understanding and so on, you all know, right? Okay. Before going to the individual factors, uh, let us go to the similes by which we should understand the Four Noble Truths. Now you, the Four Noble Truths are Noble Truth, noble truth of Suffering, and then Noble Truth of Origin of Suffering, and then Noble Truth of Cessation of Suffering, and Noble Truth of the Path, uh, leading to, let me say, leading to, leading to the Cessation of Suffering. And these uh, we understand more clearly uh, when we when we understand them against some similes. And in in Vishuddhi Bhaga, some similes are given. Now uh, it is said that the first noble truth is like a burden, a, a big weight. Say you have to 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 to, to carry this weight very very. Uh, heavy weight. And the second one is taking up that burden. That means when you take up that, that burden, say you, you, you feel heaviness, right? So you, you have dukkha there. So you take up the burden and then the burden is on you. And then putting down the burden is like Nibbana. And means to putting down the burden some ways of maybe your effort say, to throw it away. So that is uh, like the four, uh, fourth noble truth. So the first noble truth is like a burden, and the second noble truth is like a picking up or taking up the burden. The third noble truth is like putting down the burden, and the fourth noble truth is a means to putting down the burden. Another simile is the one I just and told you, that is, the first noble truth is like a disease, and the second noble truth is like cause of disease, and the third noble truth is like the cure of the disease, and the fourth noble truth is like a medicine. So if you remember this, this simile, you will never forget the four noble truths. And also another simile is given, and that is, first noble truth is like famine, scarcity of food. And the second noble truth is, what's that? Uh, bad rain. <laughs> Even with glasses, I sometimes <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't see clearly. So bad rain. That means drought or uh, too much rain. So when there is drought or when there is too much rain, you don't get crops and then uh, there could be famine. So a bad rain is the, uh, the cause of famine and so it is like the second noble truth. And the third is plenty, having plenty. The, is, uh, the having plenty is like the third noble truth and good rain, timely rain just enough rain is like the fourth noble truth. So we can understand four noble truths uh, with any one of these similes. And the middle one is the one I like best. Disease, uh, cause of disease, cure of disease, and uh, the means of curing the disease, that is medicine. <coughs> And we must understand uh, what we must do about, or what we must do with regard to these four noble truths, or what are the functions we should do to these four noble truths. They are, th these four functions are different. Now the first noble truth, the noble truth of suffering, so we, noble truth of suffering is for thorough understanding, thorough comprehension. That means we must see clearly the first noble truth. Through vipassana meditation, we can see uh, the first noble truth clearly. So through vipassana meditation, you see mind and matter, 
arising and disappearing, arising and disappearing, arising and disappearing. So, you come to see the dukkha nature of mind and matter when you see uh, arising and disappearing, arising and disappearing for a long time. Because uh, the one of the meanings of the dukkha is to be oppressed by arising and disappearing. So that is a that is the main main meaning of dukkha. So anything that is a that, that is a beginning and end that is a that is an arising and disappearing is said to be dukkha. And you see dukkha uh, clearly only when you practice vipassana meditation. You may sit and think about dukkha. You may speculate on dukkha and you think you can, you understand dukkha. But that understanding is not from your own experience, just just thinking. But when you pr- sit down and practice and see for yourself the mind and matter arising and disappearing, arising and disappearing, and later on just disappearing, then you come to know uh, the, the true true meaning of dukkha. So dukkha is the noble truth to be understood clearly. The second noble truth, craving, is to be abandoned. Because so long as we do not abandon um, second noble truth, we do not abandon craving, there will always be dukkha. So, the function to be done with regard to the second noble truth is abandoning (coughs) or eradication. Once we are able to eradicate uh, craving, we'll be able to get rid of dukkha altogether. With regard to the third noble truth, which is Nibbana, the function is realization, seeing it face to face. And this realization comes only at the moment of enlightenment. So I have told you about enlightenment many times, right? So at the moment of enlightenment, what happens? A a type of consciousness arises along with its concomitants, and it has the power to eradicate mental defilement, and at the same time it takes Nibbana as object. That means it sees Nibbana, nibbana direct at that moment. Before that, actually we do not see Nibbana direct. We may say, uh, may, may I attain Nibbana or something like that, and we may talk about Nibbana, we may uh, think about Nibbana, uh, but that is not, not direct seeing. <coughs> but at the moment of enlightenment, a, a person really sees Nibbana um, clearly and let's say face to face. And so Nibbana is to be realized, not to be eradicated, or not to, to thoroughly understand, but to see face to face. And the fourth noble truth is uh, the function to be done to, to, with regard to the fourth noble truth is developing, making it uh, grow. <coughs> now, developing can be said to be of two kinds. The fourth noble truth, we'll come to that later, the fourth noble truth the noble truth of the uh, path leading to the cessation of suffering, actually, or strictly speaking, is at the moment of enlightenment. But the moment of enlightenment is like a result of our practice of vipassana. So in order to reach the moment of enlightenment, we have to practice vipassana. And when we practice vipassana, we are actually developing these eight mental, uh, um, mental factors, these eight um, factors of the path. So, uh, during the time when we practice vipassana, 
we are developing this this path, this the fourth noble truth. But our developing in uh, during that stage belongs to mundane, mundane, mundane sphere. But at the moment of enlightenment, these eight these eight um, factors arise again together, and uh, they they do their uh, their individual functions, and they reach uh, they reach culmination. They reach the their highest uh, stage at the moment of enlightenment. So only at that stage is uh, are they called uh, fourth noble truth. We have to have what what is called preliminary practice. That is. Uh, vipassana practice. So, strictly speaking, the fourth noble truth uh, can be obtained only at the moment of enlightenment. But in order to get to that stage, one has to go through the preliminary stage, uh, which is vipassana meditation. So, during the uh, time, during the uh, period, uh, we are practicing vipassana meditation. We are uh, practicing. And that fourth noble truth. <coughs> so these are the four functions to be done to uh, to, to to four noble truths. So to to our first noble truth, the function is what thara comprehension. To our second noble truth, eradication. Third noble truth, realization, and fourth noble truth, development. So these are the four functions to be done. And it is said that at the moment of enlightenment, these four functions are done simultaneously. Not one, not one after another, but they are done simultaneously. <coughs> okay, these are the four noble truths. Now we'll go back to the fourth noble truth and study the factors one by one. Now there are eight factors in the Noble Eightfold Path. And that is why it is called Eightfold Path. And you all, you all understand the eight factors. Can you tell me the eight factors? Right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Now, these are the eight factors. First, we'll go in this in this order. Right understanding. What is right understanding? Now, first, we must understand that these these eight factors are called uh, the path leading to cessation of suffering at the moment of enlightenment, at the moment of maga. So, right understanding means understanding suffering, understanding the origin of suffering, understanding the cessation of suffering, and understanding the path that goes to the <coughs> cessation of suffering. Now, in other places, right understanding may include understanding of Paticca Samubhada, and understanding of the true nature of things and so on. Because uh, right <coughs> understanding can be both mundane and supramundane. And mundane right understanding uh, is consists of the <coughs> understanding of the nature of, I mean, the law of karma and understanding the true nature of mind and matter through uh, vipassana meditation and so on. But here, in, in the explanation given in the Mahasatipatthana Soda, Right understanding means understanding the four noble truths. So that is right understanding. <coughs> In order to reach that right understanding, we need other kinds of right understanding, right? So first, we need to have a... a a belief in or an understanding of the law of karma. And then we need to have understanding of the true nature of mind and matter. 
that there are only mind and matter and mind and matter at every moment are arising and disappearing and so they are impermanent, they are uh, unsatisfactory and they are insubstantial. <coughs> but at the moment of uh, enlightenment, at the moment of Maga, then right understanding means understanding the four, the four noble truths. The second factor is right thought. Now, <coughs> it's important that we, we, we understand correctly this right thought. Right thought is explained as the thought free from lust, the thought free from ill will, and the thought free from cruelty. The thought free from lust means thoughts that are not accompanied by or that are not associated with uh, crave, craving, lust, desire, attachment. It is thoughts uh, about giving, thoughts about sacrificing, I mean, uh, thoughts about renunciation, and thoughts about doing good to others, and so on. And thought free from ill will means it is actually. Uh, the opposite of mitta. I mean, it is mitta. <coughs> so thoughts free from ill will. Th thoughts with ill will means uh, thoughts uh, with uh, thoughts accompanied by hate, desire to to kill or desire someone to be killed. And thought free from such ill will is called here right thought. And the third one is thought free from cruelty. So this is not injuring uh, other beings, not causing harm, not causing injury to other beings. And this is actually uh, what is called karuna, compassion. So right thought means thought free from attachment, craving, desire, lust, and thoughts free from ill will, or thoughts of middha, and thoughts free from cruelty, or thoughts of compassion. So these are called right thoughts here. But how does it fit in with the practice, or with, uh, with the, uh, the factor arising at the moment of enlightenment. So, right thought is explained in the commentaries as a factor which uh, puts the mind onto the object of Nibbana, or onto Nibbana. If you have a knowledge of Abhidhamma, you know what, what uh, I am aiming at, right? Now, right thought is, in Abhidhamma, the, the mental factor, vitaka, initial application of mind. And this vitaka, or the initial application of mind, has the characteristic of taking the mind to the object. It is because of this vitaka that mind uh, goes to the object or mind reaches the object or mind climbs onto the object. <coughs> so here right thought means that mental factor that takes the mind to the object. If, if, the, if this mental factor doesn't take the object I mean, it doesn't take the mind to the object. The mind will not uh, experience the object, and so it will not see the object. So it is essential, right, that right thought takes the mind to the object. And once mind is on the object, then there is right, right understanding. So in order for right understanding to arise, to occur, right thought is of this mental factor, which takes the mind to the object, is essential. <coughs> so, right thought does not mean actually 
thinking. Uh, uh, thinking of renunciation, uh, thinking of metta, or thinking of karuna. Actually, in the practice, it is the mental factor which takes the mind to the object, even, even during vipassana. If it doesn't take the mind to the object, mind will not, uh, not be on the object, and it will not know that it is mind, it is uh, matter, uh, it, is, uh, it is arising, it is disappearing. So it is, it is very important uh, factor uh, among the among the uh, the noble eightfold path among the eight factors. So, since right thought is essential for right understanding to arise, these two are grouped together, and we say that right thought belongs to the uh, group of understanding. Right. So that is right thought. The third one is. Right speech. Right speech means actually abstaining from wrong speech, right? Abstaining from from wrong speech, and there are four kinds of wrong speech. The first one is lying. The second one is what do you call it? Backbiting, tail bearing, and the third one is harsh speech abusive language. And the fourth is vain talk, talking nonsense. So these are called four kinds of wrong speech. Abstention from these is called right speech. So there is, a, there is the, the, the hmm, how do you call that? Abstention. Hmm? There is a meaning of abstention here. Although it is called right speech, we must understand that right speech arises only when we abstain from lying, uh, tail-bearing, harsh speech, or vain talk. <coughs> so it is called right speech. Now, when you abstain from lying, you are keeping the precepts. Right? When you abstain from tail bearing and so on, you are keeping the precept. And keeping the precept means you are controlling your speech, huh? your mouth, your speech. So there is the control or restraint of your speech. That control or restraint is what we call sila. Moral, uh, sila is translated as morality, right? So, right speech has the nature of <coughs> sila, because when you abstain from lying and so on, you are controlling, you are restraining your speech. So, when there is a restraint, there is what is called sila. So, right speech belongs to sila group, right? The next one is what? Right action. Right action means, again, abstention from killing living beings, abstention from stealing, and abstention from sexual misconduct. Here also, when you abstain from living beings, you keep the precept. That means you control yourself. You control your bodily actions. So when you abstain from taking what is not given, uh, that means when you abstain from stealing or when you abstain from sexual misconduct, you are controlling your bodily actions. You are restraining your bodily actions. So it, it is also uh, the meaning of sila. Uh, so when you abstain from these three uh, wrongdoings by uh, bodily actions, you are uh, you are having right action, and then the right livelihood. The third, uh, the fifth one is right livelihood. Here also, right livelihood means avoiding a wrong way of livelihood and getting a livelihood by a right way. 
Now, people follow some kind of livelihood because they have to um, support themselves and they have to support their family and so they have to work and so on. So, some, some livelihood is not said to be at all, not said to be right. For monks, a right livelihood means go out for arms and not uh, try to get uh, requisites by unlawful means. <coughs> and for a, for a lay person also, there are some traits say, to be avoided in order to get uh, right livelihood. So, <coughs> So, avoiding a wrong way of livelihood and uh, getting the uh, right way of livelihood is what is called right livelihood here. Now here, first, uh, according to Abhidhamma, we must understand that right livelihood is also abstention from the four uh, four uh, wrong conducts uh, by speech and three wrong conducts by by action uh, by body. But what is the difference? <coughs> if you abstain from these seven or any one of these seven normally, then you are experiencing or you are practicing right speech or right action. But if you abstain from one of these actions, which is your livelihood, then you are said to practicing right livelihood. For example, a fisherman. His livelihood is killing fish. Now, if, if a, an ordinary person, if a, if a person who is not a uh, fisherman abstains from killing, then he practices right action. But a fish, but if a fisherman abstains from killing fish, his livelihood, then he is said to practicing right livelihood. So both abstain from killing, right? Both abstain from killing, but abstention of one person is right action, and the, the abstention of another person is right livelihood, depending on whether uh, what is abstained is his livelihood or not. <coughs> in the, the discourses, uh, in, in the Angotara, uh, Buddha um, preached, or Buddha taught, that a, a, a disciple, a disciple who has taken refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, should not uh, have some kinds of traits. I should not engage in some, actually five kinds of traits, and that is trading in arms or weapons, trading in living, uh, living beings, trading in flesh, trading in intoxicating drinks, and trading in poison. So, uh, Buddha said these are to be avoided. <coughs> There may be problems with this nowadays. <laughs> uh, I cannot go into uh, the details with this. <clears throat> so these are the five uh, 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 which are to be avoided uh, by lay disciples. So when they avoid these, lay, uh, these, these, these five kinds of uh, trade and engage in other kinds of trade, then they are following or they are practicing the right livelihood. And then the next one is right effort. And there are four kinds of right effort regarding unwholesome states and wholesome states. Now, there are two kinds of unwholesome states. Those that have never arisen in our minds. 
actually, uh, I mean, in this life. Those that have never arisen in our minds, and also that have not arisen with regard to a certain object. So that uh, that kind of uh, unwholesome state is called uh, that that have not arisen. Now we must make effort for non-arising of such unwholesome state. This unwholesome state has never say, arisen in our mind, but we may see or we may uh, we may know this arising in another person. So seeing that that it arises in another person, and he said, "Oh, I will uh, never let that uh, mental state arise in my mind. I will avoid having that mental state." And he makes effort in this way. And he said to be practicing right effort. The right effort for the non-arising of unwholesome states that have not arisen. And also the, the, the second effort is to abandon the unwholesome states that have arisen. That means you may have done some, some unwholesome state. And then you, you, you make effort for abandoning that unwholesome state. How? You've already done that. Repenting, thinking about it and feeling sorry, <laughs> uh, remorseful? No. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you feel sorry for that and you, you, you feel remorseful, you acquire fresh akusala, fresh unwholesome state. So you are multiplying. You are making worse. So Buddha said, And not in these words, right? Buddha said, uh, forget about it. <laughs> so, because what has been done is, is done and you cannot undo it. So dwelling upon it and feeling sorry for it doesn't help you. So just don't think about it and try to do good. In that way you can uh, overcome uh, that unwholesome mental state uh, which has uh, arisen. So, with regard to the unwholesome mental state which have arisen, the best thing is not to think about them and instead doing uh, meritorious deeds or doing wholesome, wholesome deeds and mm, making one's mind that I will not let that happen again. Not, not just forget, uh, not, not mere forgetting, right? Forgetting here means I will not let that happen to me again, let, 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 let that happen in my mind again. I will refrain from doing such thing in the future, something like that. And then you try to avoid doing uh, that kind of unwholesome uh, act again, and then try to do good. So Buddha said in that way uh, you, you can overcome <coughs> or step out of that unwholesome mental state that have arisen. With regard to wholesome mental states, there are two kinds of efforts. One is uh, the effort for the arising of wholesome states that have not arisen. There may be some wholesome states that have not arisen in you. Uh, you may have not done um, some some dana giving or some kind of sila or you may not have practiced meditation or you may not have uh, got uh, jhanas and so on. So for that for for, uh, for for attaining those states or for the arising of those wholesome states you have to make effort and that is one kind of effort. And the other effort with regard to wholesome states is that uh, effort for the growth of states that have already arisen. That means you do it again and again. So don't don't be satisfied with just practicing meditation uh, one day or one hour or taking one retreat. So you do it again and again because by doing again and again uh, it, it grows. So there are four kinds of efforts, right? Two 
for uh, two regarding ho- unwholesome states and two regarding wholesome states. And you must make real, real uh, strong effort, say, for the non-arising of unwholesome states that has not yet arisen and for abandoning the wholesome states that have arisen. And also you have to make strong effort for the arising of wholesome states that have not yet arisen and for the development of those that have arisen. And making effort in this way is not not torturing yourself, not self-modification, because um, Buddha always prays firm, firm or strong effort. So this is right effort. We may have some another occasion for talking about uh, this right effort. Now, that is the seventh one is right mindfulness. I don't need to say anything about right mindfulness. <laughs> you have been practicing uh, right mindfulness uh, many years. Uh, but let me ask you, how many kinds of right mindfulness are there? Mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of consciousness and mindfulness of Dhamma objects. So these are the four foundations of mindfulness. So sometimes we call it contemplation. Contemplation of the body, contemplation of feelings, contemplation of consciousness, contemplation of Dhamma objects. So these four uh, kinds of right mindfulness you practice at random when you practice Vipassana meditation. When you practice Vipassana meditation, you just don't practice one only. You practice all four, not at the same moment, but as they come. So, this is right mindfulness. And the last one, number eight, is right concentration. And here, when explaining right concentration, Buddha, uh, Buddha explained with four jhanas. So, right contemplation means, uh, right concentration means first jhana, second jhana, third jhana. Fourth jhana. Now here, when we hear the word jhana, our mind all, always go to the ruba vajra jhana, right? But if you have uh, studied abhidhamma, you know that there can be jhanas in uh, in path consciousness also. First jhana path consciousness, second jhana path consciousness, and so on. So. Here, uh, uh, the, the, these four jhanas may be practiced, Rupa Vajra jhanas may be practiced before, before taking up Vipassana meditation. Or even when you practice Vipassana meditation, you can practice jhana and then practice Vipassana, then jhana, Vipassana, and so on, going, going, uh, yoked together. <coughs> but at the moment of enlightenment, then the jhana is the, the supra mundane jhana. The 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 path consciousness that arises at the moment of enlightenment can be can belong to first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, and so on. So right concentration is explained as the four jhanas. So four mundane jhanas and also the supramundane jhanas. <coughs> so now we we have all eight factors now. So the first two belong to which group? Panya, understanding, uh, wisdom group. And then right speech, right, th- uh, right action, right livelihood. These three belong to sila group because uh, they, 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 they involve restraining. And then, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. They belong to the concentration group. Because without, without effort, you cannot have mindfulness. And without mindfulness, you cannot have concentration. So in order to get concentration, you have to make effort and you have to, to practice, uh, the practice mindfulness. So, uh, right effort and right mindfulness are grouped with right concentration. 
So we get three groups or eight factors into three groups. The first two belong to uh, wisdom group and the, the second three, that is number three, four and five belong to sila group, uh, morality group and number six, seven, eight belong to concentration group. So uh, in Pali, Panya group, Sila group, and Samadhi group. And these eight factors can be, as I said before, mundane as well as supramundane. At the moment of enlightenment, with the with the path consciousness, they are supramundane. But with the practice of vipassana, they are mundane. And when you practice vipassana, these eight factors are, that means if when, you, when you have good concentration, these eight factors are working together harmoniously, doing their respective functions. And only when they are doing their respective functions properly, uh, can you say that my meditation is good. Sometimes the right understanding may be not there. Sometimes, right concentration may be not there. But at every moment of good good meditation, good concentration, good vipassana, these eight factors are working together. Actually, out of these eight, number one, number two, number five, I mean, uh, number one, number two, number six, seven, eight, these five are called walking factors or walker factors. They are the real...